for staying back for the gospel meeting. Can you turn to the Bible, please? Matthew's Gospel, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. The first book in the New Testament, the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And we just want to read one verse from that. Verse number 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's read that once again. Matthew 16, 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? But what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Two questions asked by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I believe they, these two questions are the quintessential questions, not just from the Bible, for any human being. Quintessential questions. In other, in other words, to rephrase what, what we read, what good will it be? What good will it be if someone gains the whole world? You have everything in this world, yet you lose your soul. And what will you give in exchange for that very thing, your soul? Is there anything that is more important than your own soul? Is the question that the Lord Jesus Christ Ask each one of us. This question ha has to be answered by every single person. Personally. You have everything in this life. What happens to your soul? It's a rhetorical question. If you ask me. What will you give in exchange for your soul? Rhetorical question. The answer is not. No, you won't give anything. In Job we read, all that a man has, he will give for his life. No amount of material possessions, no amount of money, nothing will account for your own soul. For example, let's say someone offers you, Jeff Bezos offers you 100 billion dollars. He can do it. He has 100 billion dollars. He says, I'll give you 100 billion dollars in exchange for your soul. I don't believe a single person in this world will take it. What's the point? You're basically ex exchanging your life, your soul, with money. Well, the point is you don't have, have your own life to enjoy it. Your life is gone. So what's the point of 100 billion dollars? Nothing. Rhetorical question. What will a man give in exchange for a soul? Absolutely nothing. So we want to establish the fact that the soul is the most important thing one can possess. There's nothing about that. If you have something in your in your in your possession, it can be a house, a car, um, anything, it can be anything. But it is your soul, your life, that is the most important thing. And in our lives, in our daily lives, as we go on with our daily lives, we have become so busy with you know building our lives up, setting up you know uh, our life so that we can be successful in our future and we are working towards that and there's no fault in that, it's okay, it's good. But the, but the Lord Jesus Christ says, wait for a second, whoever you may be, and whatever you're doing, whatever you're building up, whatever positions you're gathering, compare that with your soul. Of course, don't think about it. There's something more important than everything else you're doing. More important than your job. More important than your career, your profession. More important than your success in life. Your soul. Stop, stop for a second and think about your soul. And your ultimate purpose in life changes when you think about that question. What is your ultimate purpose in life? Is it to grow in your career? Is it to get married? Is it, it is, is it to become like Jeff Bezos? Doesn't matter what it may be. Your ultimate purpose in life now shifts from whatever it may be to your soul or your life. And you ask, okay, now this is the most important thing that I possess, that I have. What am I doing about it? And the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he, he tells a story which is in Luke chapter 12, he, he, he says it in this way, he says, there's a rich man, he owns a field, he's gathering wheat from it, 
2,000 years ago, this was the story there. So now if we, if we are probably to tell the story, I don't know what we'll be gathering. Bitcoin, maybe? I don't know, something. Something that is precious. He's gathering that, and he's filled his barn. And he says, okay, the barn's over, we still have more wheat. Okay, let's bring down, pull that down, build a bigger one, store it. And he's building up treasures for himself. He's, he's, he's living quite well in his life, you see. He's, he's, all his focus is on that. But then the Lord Jesus Christ says this. But God said to him, to this man who is doing this, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. If this night, if your soul is required from God, if God decides to take away your life, where will your soul end up? Is the biggest question we need to ask. Are you putting all your energy into things of this world? Or have you even thought about the question, where does my soul belong? Where is my life going? And that's the question I want you to ask yourself today. Who am I, you may be? Where is your soul going? The Bible says, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Even your life is like a vapor. You have absolutely no control over it. Tonight, it might be required of God. It might be gone. It just vanishes away. And do you know what's going to happen to your soul or what's going to happen to your life? After, perhaps tonight, perhaps on the way home. Are we absolutely sure to say that this is what's going to happen to my soul? This is what's going to happen to my life when I die. I want to make, make it absolutely clear. We don't preach reincarnation or karma or rebirth or anything like that. God is the one who created you. Genesis 2.7 says, The Lord God found, formed man and dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the very breath of life. <coughs> and man became a living being or living soul. And God who created you, your creator, can require, can take that life from you any day, any time. If he does that tonight, perhaps this afternoon, perhaps any time in the next one minute, any second in the next one minute, what is going to happen to your soul? <coughs> the Bible says, it, is, it has been appointed for men to die once, and after this, No reincarnation, no rebirth, no karma, nothing of that sort. You die once and then comes judgment. And so if, jo if God is, if you are to die now, and if God is to judge your life or your soul right now, what is he going to do? How is he going to judge you? Is he going to say, let's name this person, John Doe. John Doe, you've lived a very good life. And therefore, I'm going to judge you on that basis. The Bible also says we serve a God who is holy and righteous. And because of that, on the appointed day, He will judge the world in righteousness. So if He judges you righteously, forget about judging, judgment by itself. But if He judges you in His holiness and His righteousness, where are you standing before God? What is your stand before God? The Bible also says there is no partiality with God. The Bible says He will render to each one according to His deeds. So I want you to picture all your deeds, your thoughts, everything that you have done, everything that you can remember. Picture that. If God is to judge you right now in His righteousness, in His holiness. What will happen to your life or soul? <coughs> the Bible clearly states there are two destinies if God is to win. When, when, not if, God is definitely going to judge everybody. When He does that, there are two destinies. The Bible is extremely clear about that. Two destinies, heaven and hell. And these are not places where you go and time ends. These are places where there is no end to time. Timeless destinations. Eternity, in other words, or everlasting heaven, everlasting hell, 
in other words. We preach to you what the Bible says. The Bible says there is a place of rest. There is a place of bliss. There is a place where God is. Heaven. Is that your destination? The Bible also says there is a place of eternal anguish. Everlasting fire. Everlasting torment. Everlasting destruction. Everlasting suffering. So if God is to judge you righteously, are you to go to everlasting rest and bliss or everlasting destruction based on your needs, based on what you've done, based on your life? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, He has put eternity in our hearts. God has put eternity in our hearts. So you might be thinking, uh, we will just vanish into space or something like that. But no, eternity is in our hearts. We all know, deep down, there is a judgment and there is a place called eternity where we will spend the rest of our life. I don't know how long. Eternity. There's no time. Timeless. Now, perhaps you've already thought about this question. Now, after I mentioned it, you've thought about all your deeds, all the things you've said. And you, what's the conclusion that we all come to? Ah, absolutely not. Zero. No one in the actual state is ever going to go ahead. Because if God judges you righteously for what you've done, for who you are, for your thoughts, for your words, for your deeds, not a single person is going to happen. Every single person is going to happen. The Bible says, mankind, every person in the room, is continuously evil. We sin and we fall short of the glory of God. The standard that God has set, we fall short of it. And therefore, we are separated from God. The Bible says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in my sin, my mother conceived me. Not just how we have, uh, uh, how we done sin in our lives. We have sinned in our lives thoroughly. Not just that, but in sin my mother has conceived me. Right from my very birth. I'm a sinner. And when God judges a sinner, He's sending you straight to hell. Period. There's no ifs and buts. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, but your iniquities have separated you from God. And your sins have hidden his face from you. Every single person in this world is separated from God. Now you might be asking, Chris, I came here to hear some good news. Isn't gospel good news? Absolutely, 100%. So if we, if we say, if we preach that every single person is sinner is going straight to hell, what can we do to save our soul? What can I do so that I may not go to hell but go to heaven? What can I do that when God judges me, He says, okay, this person does need to go to hell, you can go to heaven. Well, the answer to that, is, my friend, is absolutely nothing. You and I, as the Bible says, is the very dust. God formed us in the dust of the earth. What can you do to appease a holy and a righteous God? Whose throne is the heavens and whose footstool is the earth. What can you do? Absolutely nothing. Does that mean everyone's going to... Hell? No, the Bible says differently. The Bible says God Himself, because the incapability of human beings can't do anything, God Himself has created a way. Colossians 1 says, oh sorry, Ephesians 2 says, God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love, with which he loves us. You may be a sinner, 
you may be a pathetic sinner. And you, you, may, you, you have been conceived from your mother's womb as a sinner. Yet, God still loves you. He doesn't love your sin. He abhors sin, but He loves you. And He is loving with a great love, exceedingly great, that any word that I mention from here will do it no justice. Exceedingly great love. And He has decided to save every person who comes to Him. Not everybody. We don't preach, preach universally. There are people going to hen, he, sorry, heaven and there are people going to hell. We do not preach, preach universally. We don't say everyone goes to heaven. No. The Bible is absolutely clear. People who come to God go to heaven and people who don't come to God go to hell. Now how can you come to God? Is the question. How can you come to God so you can save your soul so you can go to heaven to be with God? And the only way you can come to God is through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, He has created the way. You can't do anything. No amount of sacrifice, no amount of candles, no amount of visiting the church. None of those will appease a God. None of those is going to make you righteous. None of those things is going to make you or pave the way for you to heaven. No. We can never be in front of God with our current state. And therefore, God sent His own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Perfect man, perfectly God in every way, to come to this earth. He took on the form of a man for the single purpose. You know what a single purpose is? To die. That he may die for your sin, for my sin, for the sin of this world. The Bible says, God has reconciled all things to himself. Just as how we were separated from God by our sins and we had no way to go to Him. God has reconciled all things to Himself. How did He do that? Through Jesus Christ. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through His blood on the cross. The cross is a historical event, my friend. It happened 2000 years ago. There was a man who lived a perfect life, the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for your sins because you and I could never live a perfect life and we could never pay the price for sin. He lived that perfect life. Why? Because he was not just a man. Because he was God in the form of man. He is the Son of God. He lived that life for you. Perfect life in every way. The Bible twice declares that the heavens opened and God himself said, This is my beloved Son, on whom I am well pleased. Not to anybody else, only to the Lord Jesus Christ, because He lived a perfect life. And that's what He was doing on the work on the cross. That's exactly what He was doing. He was reconciling a fallen mankind, fallen because of our sin, reconciling us with our Creator, with our God. And the one separated relationship is now reconciled. And therefore, anybody who puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, is part of God's family. We have a blessing. We are the children of God. And we have a home. Not this wicked place. We have a home in heaven. To be with God forever and ever. And I say this always and I'm going to repeat it again. Heaven, a place of rest, a place of bliss, is a consolation price. What we are looking forward to is to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. To be with our God. That is the actual price. The Bible says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the love of His Son. God has done this. He's taken us when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we believe that the blood on the cross that was shed by the Lord Jesus Christ has washed us completely clean from all our sin. He has conveyed us from the darkness that we live in, the filth that we live in, the evil that we live in. He has conveyed us from that life into a new life, the life of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is where we have new life. I can say for sure, for a fact, I am a child of God. I am going to heaven. Why? 
because of what I've done? Absolutely not. I'm evil. But because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. He is righteous. When I trust in Him, I believe on His righteousness. And when God sees me, He doesn't see me, a filthy sinner. He sees His own Son, His perfect Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore He says, So what should you know about it? God has done everything. He's done the work for you. He sent His Son. The Lord Jesus Christ paid the price for sin. And the work of salvation is complete on the cross. So what can you do with that? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's as simple as that. God has done every single thing for you. You need your responsibility, my friend, is to put your trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Make him your Lord. That is the only way to help. The Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the truth, the way of life. No one goes to the Father except through me. Put your trust in him. Put your trust in him. And the Bible also says, now is the accepted time. Right now is the accepted time. Today, now is the day of salvation. What's stopping you from putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? What's stopping you from believing? God himself has done every single thing for you. I want, to, I want you to come back to the question I previously asked. If God is to require your soul on the way back home, I don't know when, where would you solve it? In judgment, you will go stand before God and He will ask you. And will you say, Oh, I heard the gospel, but I, I need a more proof. <coughs> Strength, help you. The Bible says there is a day when the Lord, uh, the Bible says God has given all judgment to His Son. And on that day when the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God judges the world. Where will you be? Will you stand among all the believers who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and go to heaven to be with Him and to see Him, to behold Him, the one who died to save you, the one who put, uh, took a crown of thorns on His head, the one who gave His palms willingly so He, so uh, the Romans can crucify him on the tree. The one who allowed a creature who he created to spit on his face. The one who was so humble. Are you going to reject him? My friend, today is the day of salvation. Today is when you will have to decide where your soul goes. Right now. And that question can only be answered by yourself. Not your friend, not your parents. Not anybody, not your children, nobody, yourself. Where is your soul going if God is required of you today? Where is your soul going if God judges you righteously today? Is your soul secure in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you still waiting? What are you waiting for? You've got to answer these questions, my friend. And let's close that with that in mind. Your soul is the most precious thing that you can possess. So think about that. That's right. Our Father, we thank you again for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father, we can spend every second of our life thanking you for your Son, and yet it will fall short of uh, everything. Father, we thank you for him and what he has done for us on the cross of Calvary. He has paid the price for sin once and for all. And he has now conveyed us from darkness into the kingdom of your Son. Our Lord, we just pray if there's anyone here in this meeting who has not put their trust in Him, who has died to save them, we pray you open their hearts, convict them of their sin, and Father, we pray that they will see that they are in dire need of a Savior. And we pray you will open their hearts and we pray that uh, you will grant them the salvation, that they will put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father, we even pray for the ministry meeting following this, that will be a blessing to each one here. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you.